Welcome to a weekly review of North Dakota's legislative news. Now, here's your host, Dave Thompson, with North Dakota Legislative Review. Hi, I'm Dave Thompson. Welcome to Legislative Review. Been a very busy week at the state capitol, a lot of hearings and some very interesting votes. Let's start with one of the big things that's going to be an issue all session, and that's infrastructure. The big Operation Prairie Dog bill was heard in one of the committees in the House this week, and they, they're starting. This is an infrastructure bill that will actually change the oil and the gas tax formula. They're creating a new bucket to give money to non-oil producing counties, and it's all for roads and bridges and other infrastructure plans. We also have bills, two of them have been introduced, about uh, prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. There is a House bill, there is a Senate bill. It adds sexual orientation as a protected class under state law. Senate bill number is 2303, the House bill number is 1441. We also have what I call the three board bill. Now the three board bill is coming up because uh, they want to create three separate boards of higher education and uh, that is in the hopper right now and there's going to be a companion uh, constitutional amendment that's going to be introduced to that, that's going to be coming up. What happened on Thursday is a bill to repeal North Dakota's blue laws. Those keep stores closed until noon on Sunday. It passed the North Dakota House on a 56 to 35 vote and three were absent not voting. It now goes to the Senate and I think the Senate's gonna be kind of interesting. So we'll see what happens when that does get to the Senate. Those are some of the things that are happening in a very busy week at the state capitol. Talking to some of the legislators, they say it's only been just a little over a week and they already think it almost feels like a month because it's really gone pedal to the metal since it started. So we have, of course, the discussion on the best way to protect our schools from mass attacks. Our political correspondent, Chad Mira, sat down this week with Republican Representative Pat Heinert to learn more about that issue. We're expecting a big focus this legislative session on school safety and we've seen one bill introduced already that would allow some school staff members to conceal carry a gun on campus. It was proposed by former Burley County Sheriff Representative Pat Heinert, a man with almost 40 years of law enforcement experience himself. Now this person would have to meet a series of requirements in order to be allowed to conceal carry on a school campus. I'm joined now by Representative Pat Heinert, sir. Thank you so much for being here today. Now, uh, we're talking about your proposal to allow some school staff members to carry, conceal carry a weapon on school campuses. What are some of the prerequisites that that staff member would have to go through in order to uh, qualify? The, the bill calls for, actually, it has to start with the, with the school board within the school's jurisdiction, um, looking into uh, development of a plan to decide that if they want to carry a weapon in that school or not, and then it would move on to, they would have to put that plan together, seek permission from the superintendent of public instruction, and then come back and determine who is going to be the person that would carry the weapon in the school. It doesn't necessarily have to be a teacher, it can be anybody, but that person then has to meet minimum qualifications as to training, and then also we identified the South Dakota Sentinel plan as part of the training requirement. It doesn't say just specifically that, but it says a training very similar to that, which is a, a basically an SRO style training, um, how to deal with guns, how to deal with uh, if you pull the trigger on a gun and stuff like that. There's many, many things in it, that, uh, but it's a comprehensive study program is what it is. And so if this is something that's passed at the state level, it would still ultimately be left up to the individual school districts? Yeah, that, the whole point of the bill is to leave it up to the school districts. And um, specifically, well, the ones I'm worried about are the real small ones that don't have a law enforcement presence in their community or the law enforcement presence is quite a few minutes away. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the South Dakota School Sentinel Plan uh, program. That's something that would require about 80 hours minimum of training. Now, you obviously have an extensive uh, career in law enforcement, uh, almost 40 years yourself. Is that enough training for someone to be proficient with a firearm? Well, I think, I think in the bill it identifies that they need to, uh, in their plan, identify if they have somebody. I mean, we have people in all the schools all over the place that are former military. We have some former law enforcement officers. Um, we have some people that are just extremely interested in that and have studied it for quite some time. So I think the possibility exists that there are people out there um, that can provide 
that and then with the additional training. But it also, the bill also calls for training to continuously happen after the fact and, and work with local law enforcement officers. So additional training would be coming. Okay, it's not just you do the training course and you're done. It's something Correct. you would redo. Correct. It's, it's every summer I would expect that there'd have to be additional training. Okay, I want to switch subjects real quick. Uh, something we'll be talking about with our guests later on is the Legacy Fund. We've heard several proposals on how people would like to see it spent, whether it be uh, infrastructure loans or money toward the Theodore Roosevelt Presidential Library. Do you have any ideas on what you would like to see the Legacy Fund go toward? Well, where we're at today, uh, my, my reaction today would be is I'd like to see the, what is commonly referred to as the Prairie Dog Bill. That, that to me is the most important one. That's the buckets lined up that, that provides some of the, the funding across the board um, it gets school or gets um, cities involved it gets counties involved get townships involved uh, and then starts spreading across the money across the state okay very good representative Heinert thanks so much Thank for your you. time Dave we're now joined by the House Minority Leader Josh Boucher of Fargo thank you for being here we're always good to be with you Dave since this is your first session as a minority leader I have to ask the question why did you want to become the minority leader you know, Dave, I spent the last 10 months traveling the state uh, for my Secretary of State campaign. And through those travels, I, I got to better understand the state of North Dakota, all the communities that we stopped in and the people that are there. And so I felt in this position, I'd really be able to help represent whether we have Democratic legislators represent that district or not. You do have a, a small caucus compared to the Republicans. How does your caucus get anything done? Well, you know, we work in tandem with the, the majority party. There's a lot of things that we agree on. Uh, you know, when it comes to politics, a lot of the focus ends up being on what people don't agree on. Uh, but you just look at what uh, the governor's proposal has been and then what some of the Republican priorities have been on spending of the legacy fund interest. We agree with many of those priorities and how do we move the state forward and prepare for the future. I'll be asking about the legacy fund in just a few moments. I'm sure you will. But if you could talk about three or four of the Democrats' priorities for this session. Yeah, so first and foremost, you know, we want to make sure that uh, we are taking care of our K through 12 educators. Um, there has been, uh, you know, we've kept uh, K-12 funding flat over the last several bienniums, so to provide those school districts a per pupil increase. We also want to make sure that we're taking care of the behavioral health and, and uh, addiction services needs throughout the state. Um, there is a proposal right now to increase those reimbursements up to 1%. We'd like to see that go up to 3% for those community service providers, uh, developmental disorder or dis disability providers, uh, and long-term care. Um, third, we want to make sure that there's quality public services wherever North Dakotans are at. Last session there was a lot of discussion about uh, closing of maintenance shops, uh, people making sure that in rural North Dakota that they have access to EMS services. Uh, so we want to make sure that as, as we leave the legislature, hopefully by the end of April, that we're leaving proud of the things that we accomplished. And fourth, we want to make sure that we're addressing the for workforce development, um, you know, or the workforce development issues. We continue to have vacancies throughout the state. It's no longer just an oil patch problem, it's throughout the entire state. So how do we recruit and retain uh, those young people and those families that come here uh, to continue to contribute to our strong economy? Now you did talk about uh, the Legacy Fund and I was going to try to get into that. It's a good time to get into that right now because there are a lot of demands on Legacy Fund money as you well know. But where would you like to see priorities for the fund? Well, you know, we uh, put out a plan earlier this week. On Monday, uh, the Democratic majority or minority put out uh, their proposal, and about 80% of that aligns with what the governor is proposing, making sure that we're supporting the UAS infrastructure, making sure that we're putting money back into the Challenge Grant Program for scholarships and research through our universities there. Um, but what makes us different is we really want to make sure that we're addressing behavioral health. Um, you'll see in that plan that uh, we have included $35 million uh, to start development of about six to eight acute care regional centers throughout the state. Right now we have the state hospital. The governor's proposal is to build a new state hospital and provide care there. Uh, but what we see is when people are in their communities, when they're close to their support network, they do much better. So we want to make sure that Western North Dakota, North Central North Dakota, and the rest of the state have access to those services. Is there enough money from the earnings of the Legacy Fund to do these things? I think so. You know, we're anticipating, uh, we initially estimated about 200 million, and that's been allocated for this biennium, but it looks to be there'll approximately be another 175 million that we'll be able to use for investments. Now, you did mention behavioral health. This brings up the question because there's been a lot of talk about behavioral health this session. I go back to the Schulte report, which happened four years ago, and then the, then the latest report, which was given to the interim committee. It, we've taken baby steps, perhaps, right. we, we say, toward getting more community-based behavioral health services. 
is a time to take a giant step. Absolutely. And I think, again, that's another part uh, where we agree with the majority party, and we're really going to push for that. We've studied this issue. Everyone knows what the problems are. We need to start implementing. And sometimes when it means, you know, when we make the, the statement that we need to run government like a business, I think that means there's opportunities for us to try new things. Uh, just because things worked 20 years ago and we fund programs the same way that we did 20 years ago, doesn't mean we can't try something new. And the Legacy Fund and some of those other programs allow us to do that. Now, another thing that's coming up, we, we talked about the Prairie Dog Bill, the mm -hmm. Operation Prairie Dog, the Infrastructure Bill. And we talked before the session started, and you were saying that maybe there's another plan that might be emerging. I'm kind of curious as to where you're at on the Operation Prairie Dog Bill. Well, after discussing uh, with the bill authors and, and some folks within our caucus, and of course uh, my home district back in North Fargo, uh, there's certainly some interest in the Prairie Dog. Uh, the Operation Prairie Dog program. Um, what's nice about it is it doesn't cut out the oil producing counties, but it gives some resources that communities throughout the state can depend on. Uh, previously, we've done surge funding, you know, where we will have one-time funding and we'll use that to invest in communities, and at times that's picked winners and losers. Uh, Operation Prairie Dog allows cities, townships, counties to kind of know what to expect based on the earnings each year. But there seems to be some resistance in some corners of the house to getting that done. I, I'm assuming that uh, we haven't heard the last of this, of course. Well, you're right about that. It wouldn't be the House of Representatives <laughs> if there wasn't uh, indifference in a variety of ways. But uh, f I think, first and foremost, it sounds like that people are like this idea of some dedicated funding that communities can respect or can plan for. And just to remind everybody, it's it creates a new bucket for oil tax dollars. So it's is it the oil extraction tax, correct? Correct. Right. And instead of money flowing into the SIF fund as much, it would fill this bucket first with any leftovers. So this, this idea of creating the new fund, you have, you're okay with that then? I think so. You know, uh, looking at what communities can do, uh, you know, I'm from Fargo. Uh, we get approximately, based on this year's earnings, of $25 million. Uh, there's a lot we can do to reduce property taxes and assessments by, you know, funding roads and water projects in Fargo. Um, hearing from Carrington and other communities, there's a lot of deferred maintenance in these communities that this kind of influx of cash will help them meet the needs that they have. Another one of the governor's priorities about uh, spending in this session was to take about $50 million from the legacy fund earnings and put it toward a TR, uh, the Theodore Roosevelt Library in Medora. And I'm hearing, and just back channel talk right now, just, you know, hallway talk, that that's going to have a rough go. I think so. You know, in, in our proposal, we didn't uh, provide any funding for the TR Roosevelt um, Library. Uh, when we look at the needs of the state, uh, it, it first and foremost, we're coming off of three bienniums of cuts. Um, we're coming off of times where we state employees haven't gotten raises, where communities have felt cuts to EMS services, to behavioral health services, long-term care. We need to get that back up. And once we get our, our communities back and healthy and, and have dependable funding, then we can have conversations about some of these other legacy projects. So is the idea going to be dead on arrival or is it going to be delayed? Is there going to be any funding that's set aside for it at all? You know, I think there, there's an opportunity to find some funding for it. Um, it's not our priority within the Democratic Caucus, but we're certainly open to having a discussion. What's great about it is that there are investors, or I should say uh, philanthropists, who have said that they're committed to the project. So knowing that there's that commitment out there already, seeing what the state can do, but $50 million is a lot when we're only offering $19 million for behavioral health services in the governor's proposal. Another new spending idea that's actually got some bipartisan legs on it was to create a rainy day fund for human services and health. And I know you have people on your caucus who are on the bill. There are people in the Senate, Senate caucuses that are on the bill. There are Republicans on the bill. Yep. And uh, there seems to be a maybe more of a, a groundswell of support for that. Absolutely. You know, that, uh, Senator Tim Mathern really started that idea. Um, and I'm glad that he's working with partners in the Senate to, to get that going. I, I believe Senator Judy Lee actually introduced the bill. Um, but yes, uh, the fact that we saw how well that worked for K-12. K-12 didn't have to take cuts when everyone else was. They stayed flat, but human services took a huge cut. So if we can take, again, uh, a portion of some of those earnings from the extraction tax, the production tax, set it aside for when it's a rainy day so that you know long-term care doesn't have to feel the pain that they felt. So home and community-based care doesn't have to feel that, that impact. Our veteran services programs that deal with PTSD and traumatic brain injury, we can continue to fund those at the levels that they're needed. And since you brought up nursing homes, the nursing homes are not happy with this idea of the 1% increase per, per year in the biennium that the governor has put in his budget. They're looking for 3%. Mm -hmm. Is 3% doable? 
I think so. I think if we really commit to it and, and say that, you know, the nursing homes have, have burdened a lot over the last couple of years. We have a, an aging population. Uh, fortunately, more people are staying in their homes, and there's an incentive with the governor's proposal that we try to expand those services so that people stay in their homes healthier. Um, but when it comes to the reimbursements for our, our nursing homes, we need to get to 3%. Uh, the biggest issue they're facing, along with the DD providers and others, isn't just that they haven't given raises. Their employees have said, you know, I love my patients. I love the people I work with but it's been four years since I've gotten a raise. I have a family to take care of too. And so if we wanna keep that strong workforce, those people who are committed to taking care of our grandparents and our family members who are injured, um, we, have to, we have to make sure we're taking care of them with that 3% increase. Let me go back to something we discussed briefly about that, about the idea of creating a new state hospital in Jamestown mm -hmm. and moving some people out of New England, the prison there, into Bismarck, some people from Bismarck to Jamestown. Mm -hmm. Where are you out on that? You know, I am not an, an advocate of building a new hospital at this point. Right now, the plan to build the hospital is to meet today's need, needs. We know that our behavioral health needs have grown. Um, so the idea of having acute care centers that could be public-private partnerships. Maybe there's already a facility in a community or a nonprofit provider, uh, a hospital uh, provider that's providing these services and could expand it. We want to make sure that we're taking care of people where they're at. We shouldn't have to depend on a highway patrol or a county sheriff to bring someone to Jamestown to be held for their own safety when they can do it in their own community or within at least 50 or 100 miles of their home. So how does that impact the New England prison? Do you think that's going to stay open? I think people are getting creative. And, and that's the great thing is, right, um, Governor Burgum has a vision for this state. And by him kind of challenging um, the status quo, uh, he's allowed us to think differently. So maybe the women will move from New England to Bismarck. But the ideas that are already generating is how can we use that facility in New England for something else? A behavioral health center. Uh, maybe we bring some of the men over there. Um, maybe it's able to serve just the western portion of the state and we're making sure people are spread out again once within their communities. So to me it seems that the overarching issues of this session so far have to be behavioral health, mm -hmm. have to be what to do with the legacy fund, and this Operation Prairie Dog or whatever infrastructure bill comes out. Absolutely. I think in the end we're looking for certainty. Um, my six years in the legislature one and a half billion dollar surplus my first year, one and a, or first session, one and a half billion dollar uh, deficit my second session. A lot of us have experienced that in six years. We know that we want to make sure that we're, we're consistent, we're steady, so our communities can depend on that. And I'm glad you brought that up because the, the other thing that, that's kind of still kicking around out there is the proposal by NDSU and UND to come up with a, a sum of money mm -hmm. that talked about $100 million for research. The idea is to have research that'll move the state into different areas of economic development. It kind of har harkened back to the growing North Dakota yep. thing in the late 1980s. Does that have legs? I think so. Um, again, no one's zeroed out the research funding that I've seen at this point. I think $100 million is a big ask for the universities, but uh, it, it sounds like we're willing to compromise and find some resources. We saw the benefits to our state when we had the research corridor thriving between in the Red River Valley. We're seeing the economic growth in Bismarck and Minot and the other communities. So making sure that we're working with our faculty at these institutions so that they can help find the, the technologies and the industries that'll grow North Dakota. And, and we don't have to look any farther than what's happening in the northeast corner right now with UAS. And you, you're seeing that agriculture, energy are still going to be big drivers. Absolutely. But there's a lot of feeling that there's a new economy coming. There is, there is, and we have uh, an opportunity to engage a new workforce. Um, we are, as technology evolves, as healthcare evolves, as banking and finance evolves, how can we make sure that we're part of that conversation as a state as well? It's not just the coasts talking about it, but how do we make sure that we're the Silicon Valley of the Midwest? or making sure that, uh, again, our young people aren't just being exported to great jobs elsewhere, we can keep them here with great jobs. One area, another area that seems to be a lot of general agreement is that state employees need a pay raise mm -hmm. because they didn't get one and for some for almost three years because because of the allotments. Uh, the Democrats came out with a four and two plan. Uh, no, four, we came four. out with, a, we would like to see them get a $300 raise That's right. their first year and followed by a 3% um, across the board in the second year. So there's some room for negotiations on this because the Republicans, some have said a two and two plan, some have said, a f I think the governor said four and two. Correct. If I remember correctly. Yep. So there is, there is room for that. There is at least recognition that 
there needs to be some adjustment there. Yeah, yeah, and, and God bless our public employees. You know, they have they have felt this burden not only from not getting salary increases, but they've also taken on more of a workload, as we've seen, you know, in, in higher education alone, I think around 600 or so faculty have been removed from the system. So that just creates more work for the people that are there. Um, you know, we've done the thinning. I think it's time to make sure we take care of the people that are still here. All right, how do you come down on multiple boards of higher education? You know, as a Fargo guy, uh, I like the idea of, of NDSU being able to have its own board. But the reality is we have to look at the entire system. I don't think three boards is going to solve the problems that we're facing within our university system from a governance perspective. I think we need to look at the, the structure of the board uh, and look at their responsibilities and who are they accountable to so that we make sure that progress is being made. So you think maybe that's a dead on arrival thing? I've not heard too much support uh, for the three board. I've certainly heard more support of let's look at the board we have now and changing that in that structure for governance. What about the constitutional amendment to remove the names and missions from the constitution? You know, it's, uh, it's an ongoing conversation. Um, you know, I think we've talked about it for a decade uh, in terms of whether we need all these institutions. Um, so Representative Becker has his constitutional amendment that the voters will get to decide. And I think in the end, he's just saying, Let's let the people decide. In the end, people may say, let's, let's have some flexibility in these institutions. And in the end, they may just say, let's keep things as they are. OK, in, in the minute we have remaining, what's your date for sine die? Sine die. How many days? Uh, how many days? I think I'll be happy if we get to 76 days, I'll, if we'll be done by 76 days. But you're keeping a few days in reserve then for vetoes or whatever. Absolutely. Yeah, we've recognized that, you know, we've gone to that 80-day mark uh, for the last several sessions. That's our new normal. How do we make sure we save some days in case we have to come back? Do you have a pet bill that's coming up? I don't. I've been working on a lot of bills uh, related to issues that my constituents have brought to me. So it's, it's little tweaks here and there, and, and it's been fun to get to know some of these issues that I'm, I'm not as familiar with. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks, Dave. Always good to time. Our guest, Josh Boucher, he is the House Minority Leader from Fargo. Now this week, a committee had its first, midi, first meeting, that is, to continue discussing redesigning social services. The state took over funding social services last biennium. Political correspondent Chad Mira tells us more changes could be coming that would have county employees working for the state. From SNAP benefits to Medicaid to foster care, hundreds of people work for their county offices across the state to provide social services. But that could soon change. Here's Chris Jones, the executive director of the State Department of Human Services. If we get the outcomes that we want to see, then we would, through Senate Bill 2124, have the authority to move those employees from county employment to state employment. A fiscal note attached to that Senate bill shows the state could transfer more than 220 county positions over to the state. The Burley County Social Services Director Kim Asachuk says some employees are concerned. We don't know if one day you come in and you're a county worker and you're told, well, you're now a state employee. So I think we need more clear definition of what exactly does that mean. Jones said the changes would be minimal. By moving them, they would not see any reduction in pay and we would just move them over in order to move into a more efficient structure. We talked to the chairwoman of the Senate Human Services Committee, Senator Judy Lee. The local service providers are so important and it isn't going to make a tremendous amount of difference, I don't think, once we have it all figured out, from whom the paycheck comes. But Asachuk says if this isn't done right, it could cause a lot of confusion, having some employees work for the state and others the county. How can a zone director be advocating for the county employees that are on completely different benefit packages. Jones said these concerns will be ironed out with a pilot program before any permanent changes are made. And Chad Mira joins us on set. Chad, that was a wonderful package because that's been something I've been following too is this idea about maybe creating zones for, higher, for um, health and human services sure. and, and you know, continuing the idea of reinventing human services in North Dakota. Right, it's a lot of work. It, it started last biennium, like we mentioned earlier, and the zones, they want to create 19 zones. Uh, so that would take, that'd be quite the process. You have to figure out who, which counties are going to join up into zones, and then also you have to figure out the employee aspect of it, because a lot of county employees would switch over and become state employees. So it's still a lot of work out. Uh, might not even happen, even if the bill's passed, these are issues that will be continue to be ironed out over the next few years even.
So what else are you looking at in terms of things coming up in the next few weeks? Well, there's a couple things I want to talk about related to guns. Uh, one thing I know that you've been covering is this red flag bill. Uh, law enforcement, school edu uh, administrators are all in support of this, saying it will help reduce suicides and possibly even prevent a uh, school attack. Uh, I know you've been talking to people about that. What are they saying, how that would work? They're saying that, you know, if you suspect somebody may be a little imbalanced or something like that, you can go to a court and say, can we at least take guns away temporarily? So so they don't do any harm to themselves or to anybody else. That is getting some pushback from the NRA and some other groups. Sure, that could be expected. Uh, also involving guns and medical marijuana, we know when you go and, and, and buy a gun, you have to fill out federal forms. Well, medical marijuana is still illegal at the federal level, so that could make it illegal if you're a medical marijuana patient to own a gun. So there's a bill here in the state legislature this year that would make it legal for medical marijuana patients to still buy and uh, use a firearm. There are some interesting bills like that that are coming up. There's also the one that I find fascinating that it basically says anyone over the age of 18 can conceal carry, mm -hmm. including in schools, and that, that that might get a lot of discussion. Absolutely. Anytime you bring up guns in schools and school safety, there's always a lot of debate about it. Everyone wants to be sure our students are as safe as possible. And just one thing real quick in the few seconds we have left. This week, I expect, it's the upcoming week, I expect a hearing on the Theodore Roosevelt Library. Could be coming like Thursday. And that is a legislative review for this week. Thanks for tuning in.